Amen. Uh, as I was preparing this message, I was reminded of a coach that I had uh, my freshman year in basketball. Now, I've got to remind you, I was the second shortest person in my class, okay? So to make the team was a pretty, it's pretty, I didn't make the seventh grade, made the eighth grade. I was on the ninth grade team, but that's kind of uh, mischievous in a sense because I didn't really play. Uh, I rode the bench, okay? <laughs> and my name actually rhymes with Trey, uh, Trey and Play. And so I, I had a group, uh, there, I had a fan base, kind of, which is weird because I rode the bench. But they would yell out during the games, let Trey play. Let Trey. And so I got to play. I got to play if we were up by a lot or down by a lot. That's when I got to play basketball. Um, but I had a coach that was like a Bobby McKnight. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a guy that's pretty mean, threw chairs on the, on the basketball floor. Like, like he was, he, that, I guess that was his hero, but he would yell at you. So if you miss shots, free throws, anything, like there was just that voice like, you, you jacked up and, in so many words. I think they could curse back in the 90s. I, you can't now. So, so I got that. So I was, I was afraid to shoot. And I think many of us, we feel like we have that Bobby McKnight over our shoulder in our Christian walk. Uh, maybe it was a parent that always was criticizing you. Maybe it was a teacher. M maybe it's just that inner voice that's always saying you're never going to amount to it. You're always going to struggle. You're always going to have that sin, that addiction, that problem in your life. And, and, and I want to crush condemnation today. That's okay? Because that's what Scripture speaks of. And so just look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to crush condemnation. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm not sure about that. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. But I want to speak from this topic that's found all throughout the New Testament. I'm only going to preach from one passage in 2 Corinthians today. But if you were to just basically read Romans, Philippians, Timothy, Ephesians, especially Galatians, if you read those, you'll find that Christ saves us. And that it's not a work of you or yourself or anything like that. And so in this beautiful thing of Christ saving us and setting us free, some of us go back to living a law mentality or a performing and achieving... Uh, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go, let's go in the scripture, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, the third verse. It says this, clearly... You are a letter from Christ showing the results of our ministry. So if anybody's ever said that you may be the only Bible that somebody reads, they get that from this verse, that your life should represent and smell of the aroma of Christ. Among you, this letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stone, but on human hearts. We are confident, look at this, Paul is confident of this, confident of all this because of our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything our, uh, on our own, but our qualification comes from who? Remember that, it's not from, based on your ability. It's not based on how you can be right with God. Your qualification comes from God. Then it reads, it is not that we think... Uh, go, Oh, there we go. Verse 6. He has enabled us to, to be ministers of his new covenant. This is a covenant not of written laws, but of the Spirit. This old written covenant ends in death. But under the new covenant, the Spirit gives. Okay, so when he's talking about death, he's talking about Moses. Moses goes up to the mountain. He's going to get the Ten Commandments, right? You know those? Thou shalt not... Murder. This is my third service to do it, so I actually know them. But those should not steal, murder. Some of the, some of y'all, this is your second service. You should be up and now. I have no other gods before me. Honor the Sabbath, right? Honor your father and mother. There, there's the Ten Commandments. Also, there's 613 laws on the Old Testament. James says if you break just one of those things, you're guilty of the whole thing. There's no like partial obedience in God. So what do we do now that, that we're guilty of this law? Because I, I, I don't know about you, but I've made some mistakes. 
fallen short. Does God just say, oh, don't worry about it? No, he doesn't. He pays the price for us. Somebody had to die. The condemned man, you were condemned. You were sentenced to death. Uh, Paul writes this, when sin entered in the world, death came through sin, right? Sin came through death. Anyway, sin came through death. Death. Came. Anyway, so what, what does this mean now, though? If you think about this, you were deserving of death and sin, but Jesus says, I will take that punishment upon me so that you can be right with God. Amen. And so it sets you free. I don't know if you've ever had the heart transplant. Come on, it, it, does ch- it should change something in your heart. Like the heart transplant that there was a, a heart of stone. There was a heart that wanted nothing to do with God. It was pulled out. And like Ezekiel says, there's a heart of flesh that beats and, 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 and wants and desires the things of God. And so hopefully there's something inside of you that says, I want Jesus. Even if you're addicted, even if you're struggling with sin today, hopefully there's something, some innate desire. I mean, you're here today, so something's there, right? Something inside you that says, I do want God. Hold on to that because that's the first inkling and fruit of righteousness being performed in your life. I, I, I love that because Satan will beat you up. Yes, you're always going to struggle. My friends, if there's something in you that cares now, be excited. Yeah. I, I, I had a brother tell me one time, he said, Pastor, I did that again. Oh, I feel so, oh, I'm struggling. I said, praise God. He said, no, you didn't hear me, Pastor. I said, I committed that sin. I said, praise God. He said, Pastor, you're not, you're not listening. You're, you've lost it. I said, do you care? He said, yeah, Pastor, I care. That's why I'm calling you. I said, well, praise God then. Remember when you smoked that whole thing of reefer and you didn't care about nobody? Come on, some of y'all do. Remember when you did that sin and you didn't care? You just, you just didn't want to get caught? Maybe that's the only thing you cared about? Now you actually care? You want to honor God? You want to serve God? That means righteousness is being formed. And so what's beautiful now is you're alive in God. I love... Uh, we. Uh, last night we came to a, uh, a Cynthia Corridor. She had her 20th anniversary of being set free from a lifestyle of drugs and abuse. 20 years of freedom. 20 years. And, and, and we were hearing her testimony, and, and I loved it because she said, I was hard. I thought it was me against the cops. I was living the drug lifestyle. My heart didn't want anything to do with God. But then he cracked in. Then he performed the heart surgery. Then everything I ever did was taken off and I was made free. That's the gospel. If that doesn't make your heart alive, then you need to sing another song because it sets you free. And and, and so I love it that we're free now, but watch what Paul goes on to say in verse 7. He says, the old way, uh, which the laws etched in stone, led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face, for his face shone with the glory of God. So he went up to the mountain, he shone with God's glory, but even though that brightness was already fading away, verse 8, shouldn't we expect far greater glory Under the new way, under Jesus, right? Now that the Holy Spirit is giving life, verse 9, if the old way which brings condemnation, I need you to see this, he says it brings death, it brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way? Who's the new way? Anytime I ask you a question, Jesus is the half, half the time that's the right answer, right? So... Jesus, which makes us right with God. That means now you can have a relationship. Now you could wake up in the morning and say, Daddy, you love me. Why is that? Because of Jesus. If the, in fact, the first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. Verse 11. So if the old way which has be, uh, been replaced was glorious, how much more glorious is the new which remains forever. Now, I want to, I want to talk to you because, because he, he says there that the old covenant was a ministry of death. It was a ministry of condemnation. Condemnation meaning that you're guilty, you deserve death. And so 
why that's important, because some of y'all are looking at me like, Pastor, I'm not under the law. Like, I love shrimp, okay? So, like, leave me alone. I, like, I'm grace. I'm Jesus. But I find many of us get born again and saved, and we get excited, and we're in the honeymoon period with Christ. But then maybe a relationship goes wrong, maybe an offense taken, maybe you get that sin, and then you did it again, and you repent, but you did it again, and you find yourself in now this bondage of addiction. And while we started off in grace, we're trying to perfect our faith in the flesh. We're trying to perform and achieve, hoping that we can receive and curry favor with God. And the problem with that mentality is you're only as good as missing red lights and finding your parking spot. But what if favor from God never came from your fasting and prayer? What if it only truly came from Christ? Since I didn't shock you with that, what if you went to Mardi Gras last night and you found yourself here today and you're like, oh no, there's no way God can, ex oh help me, Jesus. What if God's not so concerned about you going to Mardi Gras, but he's greatly concerned about you being here today? Amen. You saying I can go to Mardi Gras? I'm saying if you came from Mardi Gras, not going to. <laughs> it's a different mentality. And see, what we do is we get under this mentality of trying to earn, let me curry favor with God, and if things aren't working out, we try to work harder and try to, man, if I do it, and the problem with that mentality is if you fail to perform, you condemn yourself. You hear Bobby McKnight yelling at you, see, you messed up, that's why you can't get the red light, that you're, you're, you're always getting the red light, you messed up, you, you didn't do it right, but even if you do everything right, and you find yourself, well, I'm doing it now, right? I'm doing all the things. If you don't fall to condemnation, then you fall to the other coin, which is pride. And see, pride comes before destruction. And so if you're not destroyed from the condemnation, you're destroyed from thinking you're somebody. Isn't that what Jesus said about the Pharisee, right? The Pharisee went up to pray one day, went to the temple. He said, Father, I thank you that I'm not like that dude over there. I mean, that dude don't even brush his teeth. Like, I, at least, no, he didn't say that. I fast, right? I'm good with you, right? I'm not like that tax collector over there. What's he putting his righteousness on? Comparison. I'm good with you, God, because of what I do, and what I do is better than what he does. And see, what you find is if when you get in that law mentality of that condemning self, if you don't measure up, you're looking for somebody else that doesn't measure up so you can hope that you're just a little bit better than your neighbor. Why is it important we get out of that mindset? Because that mindset leads to death. You can't Bobby McKnight yourself to the final four. Then how do we, how do we set free? It only came through Christ. The law was only there to show us we were sinners. Um, I've been throwing out a lot of theology. Let me make it really plain. I, I'm from East Texas. I heard this. I never forgot it. Y'all know what a cow patty is? All right, so a cow patty dries in the sun. When, what the law did is the law came by and it kicked the cow patty. And so the smell and the stench of our problem with sin was made apparent. And so what do we need? We need Christ, and Christ saves us. But Christ not only saves us, he continues to save us. And any time you get away from the saving power of God, you'll find that you're in this ministry of trying to earn with God, and it will lead to a lifestyle of either pride or condemnation, both destruction. So when you come up under grace, what does it look like? What are the elements of grace that show that you have a changed life? I'm glad you would ask me that question. Look at 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. He's going to say in the 12th, ver 12th verse, Since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. We are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so people of Israel would not see the glory even though it was destined to fade away. Verse 14, but the people's minds were hardened. And to this day, whenever the old covenant is being read, the same veil covers their minds so they cannot understand the truth. And this veil can be removed only by believing in what? Christ. Buddha? Christ. Muhammad? 
Come on. <laughs> There's only one way. I know it sounds narrow, but that's Jesus for you. Verse 15. Yes, even today when they read Moses' writings, their hearts are covered with that veil. And they do not understand. Verse 16. But whenever someone... Look at your neighbor and say, I'm someone. I'm someone. Look at your second choice and say, I'm someone. And you're someone too, even though I picked you twice. Or second. <laughs> Turns to the Lord... The veil is taken away. Verse 17, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is. You know, when I was doing this sermon, uh, I was reminded of Braveheart with uh, uh, William Wallace. It was Mel Gibson, but anyway, it, when, he, when he says, you can take my life, but you can never take my freedom. And that just got wimpier every service. Like 9 o'clock, it was like, freedom. 10 o'clock, freedom. And now it's like, oh, freedom. Right? I'm not responding to anything you say, Pastor. Anyway. So look at this, my friends. Look at this. When you walk in grace, there should be a byproduct of freedom. Now, when I say freedom, I don't mean of circumstances. Although God can answer prayers and move mountains. I'm not saying He doesn't do that. But there's a greater freedom that he frees you from. The first is sin and self. Look at Ephesians, the fourth chapter, the 17th verse. It says this, With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles, the sinners, the people that don't want anything to do with God. That's what he means there. Do, for they are hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life of God, the life God gives because they have closed their hearts and minds and hardened their hearts against him. Verse 19, they have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasures and eagerly, look at this, they desire, they want to do this. They, they want to sin and get away with it, right? Eagerly practice every kind of impurity. Now watch verse 20, because this is you. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new... Now, now, did you put on your clothes this morning, or did they just jump on you? Some of you even picked them out. Maybe, maybe your spouse picked yours out like me. No, right? You, you picked out your clothes, right? You put it on. Created to be like... I need you to read that there because religion will tell you this ain't true. They'll say, no, you can't be like God, right? There's no way God is God, right? I understand that you may point to his attributes and we can't be like him that way, but you can be like God in what? Truly righteous and holy. And see, here's the problem. A lot of us point to God's attributes, his omnipotence, his omnipotent, his sovereignty. We point to all his attributes, but the essence of God is love. And you were created to be like that. And so put that on every day. Take off the old sinful way and put on love. And so he frees you now to do this before you couldn't do it, before you were in the rat race and you were only led by the cheese, before we were led by impulses that go on in our mind, dopamine release, psychology is discovered. That's how you were led. You could do no better, but now Christ is in your heart. You can overcome the electrical impulses in your brain. I know psychology says you can't do it, but you can. We had somebody that come, came in here on Easter high on drugs. Their, their spouse drug them in like they were high on drugs. They got drug in here. I preached a simple gospel message, cupcake, but was all about how Jesus sets you free. What was beautiful about that is the brother came to me five months later. They were headed to Florida and leaving. He said, brother, I got to tell you something. On Easter Sunday, I came in high on drugs and you preached the gospel. I accepted Jesus and I've never done drugs again. Still, that was 2016 Easter. Still to this day, he hasn't done drugs. It wasn't a 12-step program. It was simply Jesus. How does that happen? How does it happen? It happens because the old nature was pulled out. And when it's pulled out of your heart, don't go back to trying to perform something for God. You're a son. You're a daughter. Just receive that by grace. But too often we're looking for performance instead of our position. Don't we find that with the prodigal son? 
You all know about the prodigal son, right? Amen. Goes off, squanders. He says, Dad, sell your inheritance right now. They sell some rams and goats. They give him his money. He goes off, and he performs Mardi Gras in Louisiana. And he don't come back till he's in a pig farm. <laughs> I know. I, Luke 18, if you want to read the real story. <laughs> but, but here's the thing. He, he comes to a census. He says, I'll just work for Dad. If I just work for Dad, I'll be good. Amen. Says he sees the father from a distance, and the father ran after him, he takes his ring off, puts it on him, signifying authority, takes his robe off, signifying righteousness. He says, my son who was lost is now found, who was dead is now alive. Amen. They kill the fatted calf, call up yeah. dominoes, they throw a party up in there. <laughs> and we've all experienced that, right? We've all experienced the salvation of God. We've all experienced his great mercy and grace. But the problem is a lot of us... We've experienced it, but then we go off to being the truly lost son. Y'all know who the truly lost son is? The guy that's still working there. And when he hears that dad's throwing a party for the guy that squandered the wealth, he's like, Dad, what are you doing? That's absurd. That's ridiculous grace. That's stupid. I've been working for you, Dad. I've been doing all the right things. I've been trying to miss. You should, you should help me out, Dad. Why haven't you killed a fatted calf for me, Daddy? Seeing what had happened. He, when he'd started off in grace, when he'd started off position, he was a son by birth. He went to this place that he was a servant and that he had to perform for daddy to love him. Mm. See, when you get to that place, you miss freedom. See, but Christ came to set you free from sin. He came to set you free from yourself. And when you find out you're truly free from yourself and having to self-preserve and self-protect, then you'll find you're free from others. Can I preach a little bit today? Y'all okay? So, so I love this because th there's a whole group now of people that, you know, they're like, ah, I don't love you. you you're just a hater or whatever. And they're acting like they're free from others, but that's not the freedom that Christ gives you from others. See, what he really means you're free from others, you're free now to love other people without any expectation of that love coming back to you. See, in the world system, you love somebody based on if they love you or not. And you're good with somebody, you're good with your spouse as long as they're loving you. But the moment you start loving me, we're going to have some issues. We're going to talk right now, right? You didn't get flowers. You know what I love about my wife? I got her flowers two days after Valentine's Day. And guess what? Guess what? She said, you got them for $2. You love me. Like, she's like, that's what she said. Got to get points in the sermon when you can, right? But see, she wasn't holding something against me. She could love without any expectation of love in return. Where do you get that? You don't get it from the world. You get it from Christ. We loved him because he first. And it's in that place you can have a relationship with people and they can offend you. You know, Peter said, my brother's offended me seven times, Lord. On that eighth time, can I get them back? Right? I'm paraphrasing, right? But y'all get what I'm saying. And Jesus says seven times 70 in a day. What? Where do you get that? That's impossible, Jesus. It only comes from the love of the Father in you that can now make you free from others. And so you no longer are fearing for your life. You can proclaim the gospel at work, at Walmart. I mean, we look at the, the apostles. They remember when they were under Jesus' wing, they were afraid of everything, it seemed like. Like, like when Jesus gets taken in, Peter, run, a little uh, servant girl says, you're the one, you're a Galilean, right? He had like a Texan accent. He's like, you're a Texan, right? I see you, right? And he's like, I'm not one of them blankety blank disciples. And he runs away and weeps bitterly. But yet in Acts 5, we see a different Peter. This Peter's bold and proclaiming the gospel, and they, they even throw him in prison. They say, don't preach of that name. And God's like, i got to let him out. So he sends an angel, bust him out of jail. You can't, see, you can't keep a free person down. I preach in the jail like, like twice a month. And what I find, there's some people in the prison that are more free than I see people outside the prison. Because when Christ sets you free, you're free. And so they bust them out of jail. Angels bust them out of jail. They're like, what happened? We got a prison break. They find them. And where are they? 
You would think that they would have went off into hiding. They would have went to another location. They're not accepting me here. Go where you're accepted. Go where you're praised. No, they don't care about that. They're so free from people that they keep preaching where God wants them to preach. And so they bring them back in, and the chief priest says this in Acts 5, the 20, uh, 5th chapter, 28th verse. We gave you strict orders never again to teach in this man's name. He said, instead, you have filled all of Jerusalem with this teaching about him. And you want to make us responsible for his death? Now watch this, the, the, the coward Peter. Watch what he says in verse 29. But Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. The God of our ancestors uh, raised Jesus from the dead after you killed him by hanging him on the cross. Then God put him in a place of honor at his right hand and the prince, uh, as prince and savior. He did this so the people of Israel would repent of their sins and be forgiven. We are witnesses to these things, and so, it is, and so is the Holy Spirit, who, God give, who, God, who is given by God to those who obey him. So the Spirit of God now lives in you. I love it when the Lord started dealing with me about not being a witness at Walmart. And I was afraid to pray for people and tell people about Jesus. And the Lord says, it's because you're not free. You're still trying to protect yourself, protect your image. You care more about what they think about you than what you care about me. So how did I get free? I got transformed. Look at 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. Here's the second Second aspect of a person living by grace. Verse 18, so all of us who have the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like who? Yeah. Y'all see that up there? Because I'm not saying that religion will teach you you can't do this. You're always a sinner. You're always going to struggle. You're just destined for that. That's not actually what you're destined for. You're destined to look like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. Just want to give three more subtopics off this point of transformation, and I'm going to let you go out of here. You may even beat the Baptist to the Golden Corral, but no promises. Here we have transformation, and you have to understand this. If you are walking in the gospel of grace, if you do not have transformation, it is perversion. It's not of God. When you truly find this freedom, you're going to find you're free now to look like Him. And so that image, I talked about it earlier, but that image, you were created back in the garden in purpose. God, God said, let us create mankind in our own image. And he created them, both male and female. So wives, you can look at your husband and say, both of us are in this thing now. I ne that was, never mind, never mind. It, so he created us both in the image of God. Amen. Now, what is that image? Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The apostle John, who rested his chest on Jesus' breast, says this in his epistle to the church. He could have said a lot of things about God, but he describes him in one word. God is love. Your purpose, your destiny, what you were created to be, the true image is love. But what I find is we live in a, we live in a culture of Instagram filters. Uh, we, we live in a culture where we're photoshopped and we got to put our best foot forward and we're only posting on Facebook everything that's great that's happening with us, right? In fact, they say psychologists are saying there's now a depression that's coming about from people using social media because they're like, my life doesn't measure up to that. Oh, my life's so horrible because we're only posting our filtered lives. But see, transformation, it says, removes the veil. What would it be like if you could actually come to church and take off the mask? You could come to the church and, and you need prayer and you don't have to say, you know what, I'm, I got it all together. I'm, I got it, right? And instead say, you know what, I, I need help today. I need forgiveness. I need mercy. See, humility precedes honor. 
You have to come to a place where if you need help, you say you need help. When you sin, you say you sin. You ask for forgiveness because unless you ask for forgiveness, unless you seek mercy, it will not be found. Amen. Let me give you an example. Since I, Okay, so uh, this week uh, I, we got in the mail some coupons from a grocery store and uh, two of these coupons I decided to use on a purchase, but they shouldn't be used together. Like I knew I read, I, I knew I was... I was gaming the system, if that makes sense. And so I gamed the system about $10. I even went self-checkout because I knew that's the only way I could game the system. So I get from this thinking I saved $10 to the family budget and the Lord starts dealing with my heart, right? And so I, you know, for, at first I'm like justifying it. Lord, that's, that's on them, right? They sent me it. Like that's on them. They're machines. Like, you know, we justify our sin. Don't act like you don't try to, try to make excuses for your problem. And, we, and justifying it's putting the veil over. And so you'll wonder, you'll try to go to your prayer time with God, and, and there'd be that veil when it was never created. The veil was for the law. The, there's no veil now with God. So I, so I, I go to God, and, I, and He's like, you need to repent of this. And I'm like, okay, God, forgive me. You know, I do one of those, like, God, just forgive me. Just, I repent right now. And the Lord's like, well, now you've got to go make it right back at the store. And I'm like, no, God, I'm just me and you. <laughs> I'm like, David, I sinned against you and you alone, Lord, right? It's like, no, you've got to go to the store. You've got to make it right. I said, Lord, come on, right? And it's just nagging on me. Now, I can, I can just blow it off. Not because, oh, whatever, Jesus loves me. I'm good. I paid my vows. I can continue to make sacrifices and put the veil over or I can repent. Amen. Here's the beauty. Grace gives me the ability to repent because I'm not scared of what you think of me anymore. I'm not scared of what the store is going to... It didn't matter. I want that freedom with God. Amen. I want it more than anything. Amen. Yeah, so I end up going to the grocery store. I, I have my crumbled receipt that I had to find. I save it to him. I say, hey, I... I, I I used to, I tried to make it not sound like I was gaming the system so bad, but it allowed me to use two of the coupons. I don't think I'm supposed to do that. I owe y'all $10. And she's like, oh yeah, did, did you use a, check, a cashier? And I was like, no, it's self-checkout. That's how it happened. And, and I gave her a $50 bill and she's like, okay, we're, we're, we're good. And I was like, oh, no, I need my change back. Like, and then in that moment, the Lord reminded me of Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, you know, he says, if I cheated a man, I paid him four times what I cheated him. And I'm like, come on, Lord, it's just $10 now. Lord knows I'm cheap, right? Yet in this moment, when I made the transaction and I walked away, fail's gone. I'm free. I'm walking with God. And I don't care if you were at Mardi Gras last night, repent. I'm, don't go back tonight right? And be free. Walk free. Nobody's condemning you here today. Bobby McKnight's not going to make you right with God. Only the grace of God, only the way Jesus. Take the veil off and with that become more what you were created to be, which is the image. And it says there, I love the King James Version, it says we're growing from glory to glory. See, this is something you grow into. You know, I haven't achieved. I don't look like Jesus in every area of my life, but I know this, that if I continue to submit to this process of transformation, God is going to make me look like Jesus. Some of y'all don't believe that. But see, when you begin to believe it, you can walk in it. But if you think that's just too far out there, that's, I'm never going to be able to do that, what's going to happen is you're, you'll only live to your level of revelation. So I love it that Christ now sets us free and how he started this work, he wants to finish this work. I love it when I rededicated my life in 2001, uh, I, I'd come around and it was 2002 and I was at my birthday, it was in May, uh, May, May 20th if anyone cares. And uh, <laughs> I told you I'm free, right? But, but uh, with all that said, um, my mother had sent me a card. And that day, I was really struggling. I was struggling with some sin. 
condemnation. I could hear the accuser saying, oh, you're always going to struggle with that. I mean, you've been, you, you've been struggling for six months. You've already rededicated your life. You should have changed by now. I had that nagging, just condemnation on me. And I remember my mom wrote me this birthday card. And she wrote this verse that all these years later, 20 years later, I've not forgotten. It says this in Philippians, the first chapter. Verse 3. Every time I think... Sorry, I just, I just think of the moment. Every time I think of you, I give thanks to my God. Whenever I pray, I make my requests for all you with joy. For you have been my partners in spreading the good news about Christ from the time you first heard it until now. Watch verse 6. This is, this is what I want to key in on. And I am certain, I'm certain that God who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. You know, I, I'm reminded even right now of this. I haven't told this in any of the services, but I wanted, I wanted to mention this. My son, who's uh, now all of four years old, has been growing, right? He's been growing, having fun, growing. And you know one thing he doesn't worry about is growing. He's not like, oh, I need to get to the next level. I need another inch. Like, maybe I can, right? He just, he's just eating, being a boy, playing, and he's growing. And I think too often we're worried about trying to grow in Christ. And Jesus says it. How has how worrying added any inch to your stature? What if we just gave it over to God? Our righteousness, our walk, our devotion. What if we just gave it over to Him? What would our lives look like then if we, we said, Hey, why don't you do it? It's like my children when they try to help me with a home project, right? It's fun. I enjoy them with me in their presence, but let's be real. They're not really helping, right? Yeah. <laughs> Give me the tape, Robbie, right? Like, and yet we're trying, we're trying to do the home improvement project with dad on our own lives when he's saying, just, just sit there and watch. I want to change you. I want to transform you. So I just encourage you this day, stay in grace Stop trying to perform and achieve with God. I'm not saying that, like, like, I still pray. I still love God. I still fast. I still do. But I don't do those things to get somewhere with God. I do those things because I'm already with Him. That different mentality changes how you live this life. Can we all bow our heads together today? You know, I never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Jesus. We just read in the scriptures, when someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. I talked about this heart transplant in God. He wants to take the sin. He wants to take the selfishness. He wants to remove that. Maybe you've, you've tried life. You tried it all your own way. And maybe like, like many of us, you found yourself at the end. There is an answer, and his name is Jesus. And it's this free gift of grace. It's ridiculous. It doesn't make sense. You think you have to earn something, but he says, no, I did it for you. But he's not going to push himself on anybody. He's a gentleman. He's love. He only offers it. And if you accept this beautiful free gift of grace, life is changed. Heart is changed. There's a beating in you now that, that wants to pursue after God. And I'll tell you this, that, that when I started following after Him, I've, I've experienced my best life yet. Everything hasn't gone my way, but I've been free. If you want that freedom today, you want to be free from sin, you want to be free from self, you want to accept this Jesus I'm talking about, or, or maybe you want to rededicate your life. You know, for me, I accepted Christ at a young age, but I, I strayed off into sin. And in 2001, I rededicated my heart to Jesus, and I have never 
been the same. I'm not perfect, but I'm growing into this glory, growing into the image he has for me. That destiny is laid out for you today. If that's you, you want Jesus today, just raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you today. Amen, I see that hand. Come on, be bold about it. Come on, he's for you, he's not against you. The cross says he loves you. We don't have a father that's yelling at you. We have a father that has open arms and he's running after you right now. Today's your day. Don't let this moment go by. Scripture says today is the day of salvation. Anybody else? Don't harden your heart. He's here for you. Anyone else? Amen. Father, you see all those hands lifted towards you, God. Jesus, we just ask that you would forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of offenses, God. Wash us clean in the blood. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross in our place. And you rose again. And now we get to rise with you. Old things have passed away. All things are new. And God, you're more than a God. You're our Father now. Teach us, guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Fill us. Where you are, there is freedom. And so fill our hearts with freedom right now. Fill us with that peace that only comes from knowing you. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, Amen, amen. amen. If you prayed that simple prayer with me, you are brand new. Brand new in Jesus. God just performed a heart transplant in you in the Spirit. He took out that heart of stone. He's put in a heart of flesh. I just want to encourage you with two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.